through his part. So would anyone like to share what struck them when they read the article that we are considering today? Um, just by show of hands, would anyone like to make their intervention at this point? The lead reader is asking that we first share our thoughts before he takes us through his presentation. Would anyone like to make their introductory thoughts around what they got when they read the article? What struck them, yeah, positively or negatively? Uh, Golo, kindly go ahead. Golo, your hand is up. Kindly proceed. Golo, unfortunately, we can't hear you, though I can see your mic is on. Good for public interest litigation, yeah. Okay, thank you, Golo, thank you. Um, anyone else would like to give their thoughts? Rachel, your hand is up, kindly proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, for me, I think it's the aspect, the word decolonizing. Uh, the writer says that in using the international law to grow our indigenous jurisprudence, we are not in fact denationalizing, but we are in fact nationalizing in a way. So I really like the idea of decolonizing. And uh, when it comes to the extreme end of, you know, being an extremist of the idea of decolonizing, there is religion or education or literature in itself, um, we find that the writer is quite liberal in the subject, which is uh, quite interesting. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing the lead speakers, Dr. Ambani's. All right, thank you, Rachel. Would anyone else like to share what their thoughts were, the initial thoughts on reading the article or what struck them? We've changed the give us his thoughts first and then we would make our interventions. The lead reader when we read the article before he can make his interventions. So we've opened up the floor to all the readers to just share their thoughts around what they thought when they read the article so that um, the, the lead reader would know where to pick it from. So if you'd like to just share with us your thoughts around the article, you are at liberty to do so now by just raising your hand. Thank you again for everyone who's just coming on. Thank you. So I'd just like to note that uh, tomorrow being uh, the 21st of February, it will be the Mother Language Day, so internationally. So we'll be celebrating, uh, we'll be promoting awareness of linguistic and cultural diversity. So as I was going through the document, uh, I noted in the one of the cases that uh, had been cited, uh, Christopher Mtikila, Mm -hmm. And in the case, uh, there was the and the issue of illiteracy being rampant in uh, uh, Africa and uh, uh, more specifically 
uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Mm -hmm. And there's been uh, there've been uh, uh, discussions on uh, the adoption of uh, or the, or rather the inclusion of African language. Did he just get lost? Yes, Byron, it seems we have lost you for a moment. I don't know whether you're able to hear us. I, I can hear you. Great. Yes, I you were telling you. us about the adoption of African languages. Yeah. So you see there's the issue of illiteracy and uh, there, there's just been this discussion that I've been following online. Uh, for instance, uh, South Africa, in its judgments, there's uh, there's always the infusion of uh, Zulu and uh, the, the the native languages. Tanzania, the, the, the other day, they had a legislation that requires them to write their judgments in Swahili so that it can it can speak to the ordinary man. So you see, in uh, these judgments are usually. Uh, like, let me say esoteric, and uh, so with regards to the top, the, the title of the, the article, Decolonizing Jurisprudence, I, would, I, I was of the opinion. I've just missed him, eh? Yeah, sorry, Byron, we seem to have lost you again. Are you, are you with us? Uh, jurisprudence is there a possibility can you, can you just go back a bit so i missed the point after translate after languages where, where you're starting with the the colonizing jurisprudence can you start there mm -hmm. so in the colonizing jurisprudence i was of the idea that uh, that there's a possibility where we can have, for instance, in Kenya, Swahili infused into the, the, our, our judgments so that they can speak to the ordinary monainchi. Because if you look at the, our judgments, we throw in Latin, we have a lot of, uh, it's somewhat sophisticated. So in order for everyone to understand their, their rights, do you think that uh, uh, having a language that everyone understands uh, in uh, decolonizing jurisprudence. Yes, that's what I'd like you to comment on. Dr. Ambani, I believe you understood uh, Byron's point that beyond yes. um, um, the languages, that there's, there's need to also consider changing the languages of our judgments so that this, this decolonizing of the jurisprudence goes the full hog. I, I believe that's the point that, that Byron is making. Is there anyone else who'd like to give their thoughts around the article that we are discussing today before we proceed? Melissa, welcome. Melissa is joining us all the way from Pretoria, I believe. Melissa, would you like to go ahead and make your thoughts? Yeah, so thank you, Luciana, and good afternoon, everyone. My preliminary thoughts are first that the author has a very limited uh, take on the word jurisprudence. So I'll be looking forward to how the main speaker addresses that topic on just jurisprudence in itself. Is it just a court order um, or judiciary business, so to speak? And secondly, um, just the structure of, of the paper when the author is addressing decolonization and using terms that propagate, um, what do I call it? Anti-decolonization language such as post-colonial world order. And yet these uh, global South regions try to um, empower their own identities. And also I'm just out of curiosity why this particular author was chosen to discuss a theme such as decolonization, yet there are so many African scholars on the same, um, just recently on public interest litigation, specifically Oloka Onyango, Professor Oloka Onyango from Makerere has written a whole book on the issue and um, really brought out how that sociological aspect 
that the author was trying to use as her methodology came up. So those were, I thought, the limitations of the paper, in my view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Again, it's very good to have you joining us all the way from South Africa. Thank you. I don't know whether there's anyone else who would like to make their interventions before we hand back over to the lead reader, Dr. Ambani. Is there anyone else who would like to speak before we close off this session? I'm, I'm sorry, I could not figure out how to raise my hand. I might be technologically That's all right, go ahead. Uh, uh, my one comment I would also like to see addressed is the definition of what decolonization is, which doesn't show up prominently. Is this assumption that the more we open up the courts to um, public interest litigation, it automatically means that that is decolonization. How those two translate was not so clear from, uh, from my reading. Okay. So you want, you want us to adopt a, a working definition of decolonization, Dizzy, or did I, did I misunderstand you? Do you want us to start off by setting out what decolonization means in our context today? Uh, not necessarily laying out a working definition, but trying mm -hmm. to kind of contend with what that word means, especially mm -hmm. today when it's such a catchphrase that everyone can say, for example, decolonize the IMF, which is well, mm -hmm. an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So Dr. Ambani, there, there is a, 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 a question and request that we also just discuss what decolonization means broadly and not just with reference to um, socioeconomic rights and, and the local standing, local standing requirements in the law as is the context of the paper. I don't know whether that's something that you're also able to take up in your discussion. What is the broader context oh, yeah. of oh, yeah. decolonization? Oh, yeah, actually, actually, I think that then is a, a good background. Mm -hmm. for me to start the conversation. Fantastic. Um, allow, me, uh, allow me to just say that um, I'm very excited by the views uh, made there, which shows that the students are quite um, informed and positive. Um, and actually, they, they have already preached. They have already said what I would have said. Um, at some point when I when I thought about this paper, I thought I'm uh, out of my mind. Um, I didn't know whether I should be kind enough to lie or unkind enough to say the truth, you see? Uh, because the truth would have been close to what Melissa said, although Melissa is a bit diplomatic. Uh, I would have said that I wouldn't have read this article if I wasn't asked by Kabarak. <laughs> I would not have read. Um, and I could begin anywhere. Let me, let me speak loosely. I'll not speak like at, at your formal paper, now a professor is talking, no, I'll just speak loosely the points that came to my mind because they came to my mind very loosely and carelessly. And so I'll also just say them carelessly. One of the things that struck me was the author's name. Mm -hmm. um, and I searched the internet to find out who she was. First, she's white. Uh, teaching in a university um, in the Western world um, and writing about us. Um, I don't know how uh, colonizing it can be for a colonial master. I think she's from the UK herself, actually. A colonial master writing about us. Um, it's like a man talking about the labor world experience. I think that would be unfair to the women uh, because no man has gone through labor world, you see. Okay, so I felt that way. It was really unfair that this woman was writing about us. And, and because of the author um, and the author's background, she missed out on fundamentals, uh, you know, a lot of fundamentals, including what the students have identified, I'm, and I'm so proud of them. One of them is actually the issue of what is decolonizing? You see, when do we say we have decolonized? Because we have done what white people do. You see, um, so the fundamental problems with, the, with many things that I said, I didn't even know where to begin. If I looked, for example, at the state uh, that we are dealing with, allow me to begin by saying that that state is a colonial one. The state you have at the moment is a colonial state uh, founded on colonial principles. 
and not just the state, the other institutions of the state, and that includes the courts. The courts as we know them today are colonial institutions. Uh, the legislatures as we know them today are colonial institutions. And to the extent that they actually meet our needs is accidental. Um, they cannot meet our needs by design. Their very design is to suppress or oppress us. So when someone celebrates sideshows and says we have decolonized through sideshows, that person misses out on fundamental principles of decolonization and decolonial principles. Um, let me maybe just take some time to talk about what I think about courts um, as colonial institutions. Number one, courts are elite institutions to protect elite interests by their very nature. Um, and so um, if you're looking at a judge, a judge is a westernized person in the in the colonial in the post-colonial era before it was a white man okay um, schooled in white methods um, using white tools in this case to solve problems for white people and in the colonial phase in the post-colonial phase uh, we might be having some black people but all they do is to use colonial methods and tools to defend the same interests, elite interests in society. So courts are hardly for normal people. Um, so when we celebrate, for example, public interest, it is me simply because um, we are trying to, ent to, to get some space for ordinary people in those courts. That's the only reason we are celebrating public interest. And I agree with her to a limited extent that public interest litigation is a good thing opening up standing is a good thing, not because it decolonizes, but because it gives us some limited space, okay, to sleep in the servant's quarter of the rich man. Um, that, that's how I see it. Um, and it's not something to celebrate, except as just something to claim some small space um, in a very, very foreign institution. And it has to allow us to make that one step. Remember, I've talked about the judges. Now I can talk about the advocates. Advocates were also elite institutions, barristers, solicitors, only for the elites. Um, for those who uh, I think you're young enough, um, so you might not know this, that to be an advocate before, you had to work for a lawyer for many years. Um, and that lawyer had to know you, uh, pick you from somewhere, which means you had to know them. And they were elites in society, so not everyone knows elite people. Um, they had to sit with you, monitor you, and when they are satisfied that you can join the club, then they could say, okay, this one can join our club of advocates. So they would write a uh, who, when graduating from that system, now could be a barrister or solicitor, depending on the system we are dealing with. So it was an elite institution, a club, so to speak. Uh, like Mudaiga Golf Club, if I was to use an example. Uh, so to access that institution, you had to know someone in the royalty, you know, to become an advocate. We litigate before courts that have lords. Um, just for your information, the word lords means that they're also royal. Um, the United Kingdom, where the term comes from, you are part of the royalty. Um, to litigate your interests before the court, through you had to use an advocate who then you had to pay, you see. So already there are serious limitations here because ordinary people cannot address that institution. Ordinary people cannot Sorry, Dr. we've lost you again for a bit. Um, so they have to pay someone. It's do its role, says it's not, um, advocates are told not to charge very little more. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? 
yes, now we are good. Kindly proceed. You're okay. telling us about okay. how advocates are elite, yes. Yes, elite, and, and they're the only ones who can address, again, the elite judges, you see? And for them to speak for you, you have to pay them. Okay? Um, and the system is such that you can only litigate private interests before courts. You must show that you're connected to that issue. Uh, are you seeing how alienating that institution is? Okay. Uh, private rights means, for example, that my land has been taken away. That's a, that's a right. Yes, it's a right to property, but it's your land. Or someone has stepped in my land and grazed their animals there. So I pay an advocate to defend my rights through that forum. So to imagine that courts can be decolonized is actually to dream. Um, what we can say though, is that we can push them a little to see some ground, which is what public interest litigation is. And no one should celebrate that as decolonization. I think that's an insult. Uh, putting us in SQ for a night doesn't make us owners of the house. That's what I mean. Um, and so I was a bit very disturbed by that. So that's on the private rights front. On the public rights front, the institution the state creates is the legislature, normally. Um, and the legislature, again, uh, advocates for global issues. Global issues, I mean, issues that affect dominant voices in society. And so an MP is unlikely to be advocating for um, one person's right, no, uh, you know, or two people or 10 people. A member of parliament is very likely to be advocating for rights that affect a significant size of the population. Usually the dominant voices, voices again, could be the dominant uh, class, could be the dominant community in terms of you know, context, ethnic community, could be the dominant race, and their issues are the ones that are likely to be um, canvassed before legislative authorities. So in terms of, uh, of the two sides of rights, in the, the, you know, the public and the private, you can clearly see that the state as currently structured um, is out of place. Um, it's not relevant for the ordinary person. Um, I hope then I have been able to show you uh, that what you are celebrating there is a minor victory. Um, just one battlefront that uh, we can talk about. Nothing worth shouting out like the lady does. And that's why I said she missed out on fundamentals. What do I prefer? I prefer a society and not the government and not the state. Society is always a blessing. And in that society, ordinary people have voices. I'm not saying perfect. We still had issues. For example, if a society was multinillion, maybe the men were out or patriarchal, the women were out, or sometimes persons with disabilities are left out. But it is still uh, an entity that I'm willing to recognize as capable of talking about our rights. And that is the institution that I would want to champion, society. Is it possible in the, in the postmodern state or in the postmodern formation? I think yes. And there are many ways we can get back to society. Um, some of those ways are already in the 2010 constitution. And which is why for me, though I don't believe in these post-liberal things of uh, international human rights, I don't talk about them uh, um, daily as uh, celebrating them. I believe they could be used to advance our interests. So that, for example, if you're looking at our constitution, Article 159, which also has public interest, actually, which takes away standing and technicalities of procedure, also provides for alternative dispute resolution. So that I am thinking that villagers should be able to determine disputes in a traditional sense. And trust me, villagers know their problems and they can solve them in a fair way. Once they are empowered and once they are conscious, that that society makes sense for them. Um, I would advocate for such kind of things and not a court where foreigners who are schooled in distant methods are championing our rights. I don't think we can, we can go far that way. Um, how, what else could I say um, 
in this regard, and I told you my thoughts will be very confused. Allow me to just give an illustration I've always given about these methods and why they're so foreign. And I've always referred, say, to the law of thoughts, uh, which is what Jill Guy referred earlier in one of the papers she wrote. Um, can you hear me still? Yes, we are with you, Dr. Ari. Okay. okay, okay. Professor Jill Guy once wrote about, say, the law of thoughts. And um, if you're thinking, for example, of the law of diff deformation, there used to be a case that we studied in the first year. I don't know if that was case you, that line of cases about a man who, whose picture is taken with another woman. And the man is married to another woman, happily married to one wife. And the understanding here is that he has been defamed for being uh, immoral because a picture of him was taken with another woman. And it shows that he's cheating <laughs> it's cheating on his wife. Um, there are difficulties with that approach to the law of defamation. Uh, number one, that it forgets that an African man could marry more than one wife. It also forgets at the point of that judgment that an African man cannot cheat because the system in which he marries allows him multiple women. So cheating is only possible if you are restricted to one. I hope I'm making sense, and I'm sorry, it looks patriarchal, but I'm just giving an illustration of cultural problems when you use those foreign methods, which is what this article is advocating. Um, so a judge sitting and using the, case, the line of cases and all those funny, funny cases ends up judging that the man has been defamed. The reality, however, is that this African man cannot be defamed. In fact, it makes the man look better if he has women and many of them joining him, in addition to the ones you already have. I'm talking about 1960, 1970. Uh, things are changing, and I think now we must talk about a different cultural uh, background in Kenya. But just to illustrate the point, if I went specifically to the issue of environmental rights um, and want to even use um, the colonization language there, we'll meet with the real, real practical problems. Um, number one, again, I hope all of you realize that the Western world has been very industrialized. It looks like a good thing to say industrialized. But I also mean that they have degraded the environment seriously, terribly, badly. They have no environment left. And not just the Western world, the Eastern world as well. Um, some people have been saying that for the first time in several years, probably 30, 40 years, China has seen the sky. Um, I'm sure most of you by now know that when you're in Beijing, you probably could not see the clouds or the sky. It's all misty because of the industrial pollution. You can't see, you can't even see sometimes five kilometers ahead uh, because of the mist arising from the industrial activity, a lot of smoke. Um, Africans are the only people left in the forest. Rivers, if you want to see a river that could move from the source to the ocean without any industry polluting, that is only in Africa. Yeah, if you want to meet um, 10,000 square meters where there's no smoke in the air, it's only in Africa that you meet that. And some of us who are the colonial, the colonial experts, we have been saying uh, that the person to pay for the environment is the white people, not us. And we deserve to be paid, um, uh, I don't know whether I should go into all these details, things like carbon, um, carbon, you know, carbon benefits for sparing the environment at the expense of the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world is enjoying, partly because Africa has not exploited its resources fully, okay? Has not exploited its environment fully. So when you celebrate, for example, environmental jurisprudence and say that's the colonization, you are missing the point again, very seriously and badly. Um, that is environmental rights uh, mostly to champion Western interests. Um, I, I know I look controversial. Um, I'm not saying that someone should dump litter next to your house, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not saying that we should throw polythene on the roads, no, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that it's in the interest of the Western world more than us to protect environmental rights. So to the extent that even that is where um, the issue of local standard began, that is where um, a lot of resources began, a lot of civil society organizations began. And that is where, in fact, 
um, the world was willing to give an Africa UN headquarters. Um, again, just for knowledge, Nairobi is the only uh, major UN headquarter in, 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 the, in Africa because of UNEP. Um, it's because they were keen, more keen on environmental rights than us. We were already a bit secure even at that point um, when this litigation was happening in terms of environmental rights. Um, the other thing that also came to mind, I'm sorry, I said I just speak like a mad person because that itself is mad. Um, is the issue of India. Again, because most of us are students, I'm sure you'll remember that when you make a claim at the introduction, when you make connections at the conclusion, the body must demonstrate that connection. Where in this paper did the author connect India to East Africa? Who tells her that we copied these things from India? Is it not madness? Is it not uh, a continuation of racism? As we'll all recall, um, the, the British colonialism had cast, you know, hierarchy, you know, among African among among the, the world races. So hierarchy number one was the white people. Uh, second in the hierarchy were Indians. Third in the hierarchy were Arabs, and then down there were us. You see. Um, the Ash guy um, always told me that um, one of my favorite scholars who, who I, I, I really admire a lot, who since passed, Professor uh, Ali Mazrui, was an Arab who wanted to study law, but he could not study law because law was reserved for only Asians and white people. Yash himself told me that he wanted to study political science, but he could not study political science because it was lesser than law and reserved for people like the Arabs. So Ali Mazrui ended up studying political science while interested in learning law, while interested in politics. And, 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 and that shows you the kind of society that the white man had installed. Um, what am I saying in other words? This thinker, through the colonial lenses, thinks that Africa could only have done what they've done by emulating India. Africans can't do much on their own. They have to emulate India. And there is no evidence of us emulating India on this issue. If, by the way, she had talked about, for example, epistolar jurisdiction specifically, um, and I think Bhagwati was behind that in India, Justice Bhagwati, um, whereby you can institute litigation through a letter. That appears to be a very, very Indian approach, um, uniquely Indian. And we have not even done that here. I know that William Mutunga had initiated that procedure um, where you can write a letter to the registrar um, just saying, oh, I've been kicked out, I'm suffering, please help. No civil procedure, and, <laughs> you know, no constitutional petition procedure, no, not following Mutunga rules, but you just end up being listened to. And in fact, somebody can reduce that into legal issues and then your matter can be addressed. That's what we call epistolar jurisdiction. That is uniquely Indian. If that is what she was talking about, I would have agreed with her that that is Indian. But in terms of just expanding standing, that has never been an Indian influence here. Um, it was our own uh, initiative, a product of the struggle. And, and, and Elisha Ongoya is here, Luciana is here. Those are people who can tell you uh, at your free time that when Kanu wanted to put up a tall building in, 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 um, in Uhuru Park, the likes of Ongari Madai went to the streets, you know. They demonstrated, they fought, and she went to court to, you know, fight for the environment to preserve Uhuru Park for the poor people. When she did that, she didn't know, she didn't even think that India was doing that. It was an immediate reaction to an immediate problem that we had. And the judges told her, no, we shall not allow you to litigate um, on, an, on the environment here. We shall not let you do that because you cannot show us a connection between your interest in Uru Park and you are standing in this court. So next time we had a chance to reform, and I've always said that Kenya has been learning from the past and reforming uh, the problems that it faces. The issue of standing constantly came up and it wasn't just in environmental rights. Ongai will remember also that uh, some of the cases we learned in the Bill of Rights 
related to someone who has been arrested, needing to be spoken for by those who are free, and courts who deny standing in the past. Okay? It took a lot of struggles for us to begin saying that if you are, say, not able to speak for yourself, someone else can, and it was a product of our own internal struggle. To deny us that history and to take this to the Indians, I felt was another uh, form of colonization on the part of Elizabeth, and we shall not accept that. And so I joined Melissa on that view um, that I think there were better articles to read, and I suggest that we should do this soon. Um, Oloka Onyango has written an entire book, and I remember I interviewed um, uh, you, you, uh, you know, Dino Ngoya here and myself when he was writing that book, which means that he actually even spoke to real Africans um, that have, have, have dealt and, and suffered these things on the ground. And therefore his book is likely to be more on the ground and in touch with the reality um, than that one written by Elizabeth. Um, I think there were questions here. Let me see which ones I have not talked about or spoken to. Um, yeah, there was a question about what is decolonization? And I think I've begun by answering part of it. Decolonization is radical. It is not just about the surface. It is deeper, you know. It is critical, if I may use foreign or Western methods or words. It is critical in the sense that it touches the very base of the problem. It just doesn't deal at the surface. So we ask ourselves, where did this state come from? Who brought this state to us? Was it for us? And the answer is no. The state was not for us. It was brought by colonists to pursue their own interests. And even representation in those houses is a fairly, representation for Africans is a fairly recent phenomenon. So we cannot be celebrating those small victories. The other question was raised about India, and I think I've tackled that. I don't think we learned from India. But it should be seen as the father, more to it, I suspect. Um, I'm quite happy about the young man that referred to language, language day being tomorrow. Um, Ongo and I were joking about the other day, 14th, that all the young men were celebrating and women. Um, and Ongo was saying that our day is Labor Day. We, the workers, we are waiting to celebrate Labor Day. That's the real day for us. This other one, we do not understand. So I'm happy that the young man knows about language day. <laughs> um, and I'm happy that the issue of language as a reason is um, when judges speak in the languages they speak, are they speaking justice? Or there's already an injustice at that level of what they speak? And yes, I agree that the courts must decolonize the language they speak. Um, it keeps us out of uh, those courts. It sidelines us. And it reminds us that those courts do not belong to us. So I don't like the language they speak. Um, secondly, I also agree that we need to translate the constitution into Swahili. You know that has never happened. Or has someone seen a formal Swahili translation of the constitution? The ones I have seen instead have been done by civil society organizations. I'm still waiting for the attorney general to do formal Swahili translation of the constitution, and, and that would be a good step in the right direction. But that is still within the colonial parameters. In my view, the African um, tradition is oral. The African society um, leaves its experiences. It leaves its norms. It doesn't write them. And we, we are still pretty much like that. And so, I would really appreciate if the constitution can go to this third level, not just translation in languages, but to get to our hearts, you know, to get to our communities, so that we can leave the constitution. So that if anyone, um, for example, um, wants to take away another's property, the people can say, no, I huyo. If someone wants to call a person with disability an idiot, the people can say, no, 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 no. A person with disability, it's a human being with the full rights of human beings and they should be defended. Um, I say so because I'm doing some work for the judiciary and I, the idea is to modernize the criminal procedure code and the penal code 
And one of the reform areas I'm suggesting is to remove references to persons with disability, especially mental disability, um, in bad light. The Penal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code still refer to idiots, imbeciles. Can you imagine how colonial that law is? Lunacy, insanity, people, insane people. Those words are used in our laws or legal frameworks. We need to decolonize those. And we need to have that language of decolonization among African people, because African people did not criminalize or they do not criminalize um, disability. Uh, they in fact protect uh, persons that are, appear to be weaker in society. So that's what I mean. We move the constitution to the hearts of the African people in the, in the cultures, in the values, and also in the oral tradition of the African people. That's where I want the constitution to be. Um, I don't know whether there's anything else I'm leaving behind because I've addressed the main issues that arose for now. And I think I'm willing to take another round of discussion before I can say my final points after that. Over to you, uh, Luciana. Asante, Dr. Um, Tim, I think you can agree that the first portion of our discussion has been very illuminating. I think we can now say that we have built consensus around the direction that we want to go. And I'd like now to open the floor up again for those who had missed the first round of discussion. Christine, I think your hand was up at some point and you wanted to make an intervention. I don't know whether you want to start us off for this second round before we take another set of um, comments. Christine Juma. Yes, uh, sure. I wanted to specifically say that the author in the beginning had uh, for me given a very good basis of the progression from the public interest being based on specifically having to prove sufficient interest in the matter. And yes, he, the, the author even gave a Canadian case as an example and the three faces that the Canadians would use to prove whether there is sufficient interest. Mm -hmm. But I felt that that was not the way we transformed in the issue of a sufficient interest because the Wangari Madai case and the other cases that the lead uh, discuss, uh, has mentioned prove that we as Kenyans also evolved in our own way concerning the issue of proving sufficient interest. So I feel like my question was well answered. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, Dr. Ari, as we're waiting for uh, other hands to go up, there is a couple of comments that have gone up on the chat. One is asking, is there any hope for Africa? Are we stagnant, progressing, or regressing? I don't know whether that's in a broader sense or in the context of decolonization. Mr. Bugasu, in case you'd like to clarify your comment, you are at liberty to just raise your hand and just make that context clear for the lead discussant. Uh, Mr. Ngoya would like to know, do our people communicate more in English than they do in, sorry, more in Kiswahili than they do in English? Do our people understand their local languages or dialects than, than they do English? Is there evidence that African languages are more humane than lunatics, imbeciles, or the English language? I think this is in reference to the proposal to decolonize further by having our constitution and legislation reflect our languages. So how does that tie in with the language that we use as the people? Um, are we likely to go a more humane way if we translate it uh, into Kiswahili. Um, again, the floor is open and if you'd like to make your intervention kindly, um, let me see it by a show of hands. I see there's a couple of people who already would like to make their interventions known. Um, Mr. Ongoya, shall I start with you? And then I can come to Rachel. Thank you, Luciana. I hope I can be heard. Yes, kindly go ahead. In 1974, and I'm commenting on one very limited aspect of uh, Dr. Osava Mbani's uh, presentation, there was a constitutional amendment. There was a constitutional amendment uh, that uh, then made Kiswahili both the national and the official language. That amendment resulted into Kiswahili becoming the official language of parliament. My recollection of accounts of that epoch as documented by our constitutional historians like Yash Palgai and uh, Justice uh, J.B. Ojuang is that 
and, and also partly by Ali Mazrui in his article, Katiba na Kabila, if African politics are ethnic front, can African constitutions be ethnic proof? They document that the men and women who had been eloquent yesterday when the official language of parliament was English became numb today when Kiswahili was made the official language of parliament. Mm -hmm. That's the essence of my chat section. That mm -hmm. if we if we if we precipitate a revolution whose net effect is that, is that a step forward or a step in the reverse? My second question is this delegitimizing of thoughts by virtue of the author. This mm -hmm. author is English, this author is American, and that mm -hmm. in and of itself makes her thoughts on the subject matter lesser legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I teach at Kavarak University and I have not authored one article on decolonizing jurisprudence. And therefore, if I ask my students yet, then localize themselves to Kavarak University. I may be a little unfair to them. I would want Dr. John also come and reflect on that as, um, as, as, as well. Uh, then also think about the following. I was in Mombasa two days ago talking to judges about judicial reform. And these questions arise here arose. One of the questions that a judge raised for plenary to help him was, he referred a matter to Alternative Justice Systems Resolution, AJS. Mm -hmm. One of those communities down there. Mm -hmm. The parties went away. One party had assaulted another by cutting his arm. Mm -hmm. The parties came back to record a settlement that they had already sorted out their matter. This other party also had no arm. In their culture, if you lose my arm, I shed your blood as well by chopping off your arm. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know whether he would mark that matter as settled and encourage that form of justice system. Because in that culture, that is justice. I want Dr. John Osogambani's thoughts on that question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ongoya. Um, Dr. Ambani, shall we see your thoughts before you respond? Let, let, me, let me respond to these ones that have been said. Okay, go ahead. Because they are too heavy. They are too heavy. Okay. I can't uh, take more than this one now. Right, uh, let's, let's I don't know where that. to begin. I don't know where to begin. Eh? Is there a hope? Yes, there is hope for Africa. Uh, but that hope also must be carried by us. Um, to be honest, I have never seen 47, or is it, I'm seeing my charts here, 48 young people sitting to discuss issues affecting their society. How can I say there's no hope if 48 people in Kabarak University on a Saturday afternoon, when they could be doing interesting things, isn't it? Um, there are DJs somewhere, isn't it? Uh, doing stuff on their machines or gadgets. There are bouncers somewhere who are waiting for guests. You could visit those ones today, isn't it? There's, there's plenty of uh, nice things to be done, but young Africans are sitting today, deliberate on their legal system. I see a lot of hope there. I've already identified that we have had struggles like those one Karima they had, um, like those we had in the constitution. Um, Kenneth Matiba, you can find those cases, Koigo Amuere cases, um, you know, um, look, at, look for those cases, um, even Reverend Timothy Njoya, which I don't agree with, and the author needed to have been in Kenya to understand that the case was bad when made, but the jurisprudence is good when applied. Um, she doesn't know that because she doesn't live here. Um, but I mean that we have had our struggles and through those struggles, we have evolved the law, okay? And the law is moving forward in the right direction, in, in my view. We each day are winning a battle. And, and eventually I think we shall win the entire war. Um, the constitution, for example, is an example of a battlefront that was won um, on the issue, for example, of standing, on the issue, for example, of technicalities of procedure, on the issue, for example, of public participation. I think the constitution is a forum where a lot of progress was made. Yes, I see a lot of hope, not just in Kenya, uh, but across Africa, um, this, um, uh, these war songs, uh, the, the, this victory is actually um, quite quite vibrant, and, and I can see that in the next few years, Africa is the place to be. Um, in terms of language, I am not quick to make a finding about Kiswahili versus traditional languages. 
Kiswahili versus English, because Ongoya rightly says um, that those that were quite eloquent yesterday could not speak tomorrow, because there are people right now who can only speak English, including on this forum, uh, which is sad. Um, when you say, let us speak Kiswahili, they will not be able to do that. Um, I, 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 I ran a similar platform in Strathmore. It was called the Hats. I think it's still there. I hope the, I hope the young people can carry it forward. Um, um, in the heart, we decided that one day we are going to have a full discussion in Kiswahili. Very few of the members could speak Swahili. Uh, and, and those who could speak spoke broken Kiswahili. Uh, and I always say, Kinaudi, Icho Kiswahili, Walicho Kiongea, Kilikua Kinaudi Sana. And I wasn't happy with the Kiswahili they spoke. Um, some spoke Kiswahili with an English accent, and that is even more, uh, uh, you know, more punitive to us who are trying to decolonize. But secondly, it's also the argument uh, that Professor Ngugiwa Tiongo has uh, been making all through, that Kiswahili colonized African languages. Uh, that this preoccupation with Kiswahili actually kills the other African languages. Um, if you have met anybody from Western province, uh, the Luyas, for example, would be a good example where Kiswahili dominated and killed the other languages. If you met people from the coast, um, that's another area where Kiswahili killed and colonized the other languages. Remember, Kiswahili is predominantly uh, a fusion of languages. Um, I could think that the percentage of Bantu is high, but beyond that, we have Arab, we have, a, we have a Portuguese language, we have Indian language, and many Kenyans do not even know that words like Meza are Portuguese, words like Bendera are Portuguese, uh, words like uh, Chai are uh, Indian, words like Chapati. In fact, the entire culture of Chapati um, is an Indian culture and tradition. Um, so Kiswahili has a lot of fusion of other cultures, which is good because I believe in cultures mutating and growing organically. Uh, but it is also bad in the sense that it then uh, dominates um, the space that other traditional languages would have occupied. Um, and so even as we talk about languages, we need to be very careful uh, which language we speak, how, where, in which forum. I think that some languages are endangered, Luya being one of them, and coastal languages uh, being second, because people from those communities no longer speak their languages. Um, but in terms of the constitution, my view is that we need to take the language to the communities. And the communities understand uh, the values, the communities understand uh, morals, the communities understand ethics, and, and we need to bring down the constitution at that level. Um, I agree with Ongoya that not all languages are humane in, 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 in every way. So for example, in my language, a madman is called Omusiru. Not a madman, a person with some challenges, uh, mental challenges is called Omusiru, a fool, which is the same as idiot in English language. Uh, or a person who cannot speak can be called Omusiru simply because he cannot speak. Uh, say a person that is, uh, has, has hearing and speaking problems would be called Omusiru. And, 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 and yet that word means an idiot. Um, so there's also need to decolonize our languages. Um, and to decolonize them means that we infuse new values in their place. And the new values are those values that respect others. Um, our languages have also bad words for neighbors. Um, among the Luos, for example, um, the Luyas will be called Jamua, you know, uh, uh, foreigner, isn't it? Uh, and it's not a good word, it's derogatory. Um, the Kalenjin will be called Jalango, you know. And, and that also is not a good word. And similarly, challenges of their own words for foreigners, ask, Kikuyus of their own words, and so on and so forth. And I think we need to decolonize those aspects of African culture because they were also colonized and they need to be decolonized. I just don't mean that we, can, we must colonize only Western civilization. We need to colonize aspects of our culture that are also not good. We decolonize them. Um, but the colonization the, the decolonization um, must accept that cultures change, evolve, 
which is why I celebrate Kiswahili. And that when cultures evolve, for example, we have more appreciation for persons with disability, we incorporate uh, positive languages in our languages, we incorporate positive values in our languages. And that's how the constitution can be translated in my view, move it to the masses. Some people might be wondering how you do this. And I'll be asking you, how did we um, move corruption to the communities? How did we move corruption, which was fairly a Western concept, um, which was fairly a, an, an initial elite problem into the masses? Um, right now, everybody is corrupt. Everybody in a small and big way is corrupt. Um, so co corruption has become a community and national enterprise. We can do that with the constitution. We can take the constitution to become a community and national enterprise. Um, living in Germany, for example, or, or if you visit Germans, um, you might notice that they are a bit now very careful about race issues um, uh, after 1945. Not, I'm not saying they're perfect now, but you will find that they are more serious about that than the other white people. And part of it could just be learning from Hitler and all that in the aftermath. And they have managed, I think, to a large extent, to take the issues of inclusivity from the constitution into the people's hearts and voices. And I think that's where I want the constitution to go. The positive values of the constitution, can they be translated into our hearts? Is it possible? To do? If we did that, we just say the constitution is now in Kikui language. The constitution now has been translated into Kikui language. I think those are small victories. The bigger victory is to move the values of the constitution into the hearts of the people. Um, about the author, uh, where challenges me about that. Um, and my take is that there are particular aspects, particular aspects um, that are quite specific to certain people and that a foreigner writing about them uh, might miss out on the fundamentals. Um, there is a case, I hope I can use some uh, very personal examples here. There is a case I only found once in the library at Parklands. I've never found it again. Um, I even lost the name of the case. And if you find it, please send it to me. I've really been keen on it. Um, the case was about, I think it was related to, it was related to, to a case we, we, we did also in contracts in first year. Is it, what was the name of this case? Um, there's this case where um, a, a company provides a drug, or is it provides something and says, this drug will work, okay? If it doesn't work, we shall pay you. And I think somebody buys the drug and does exactly what had been said, but the drug doesn't work as anticipated and they sue. Um, there was another one that is rarely used in books, but I found it accidentally when I was reading as a younger person before internet arose. Um, and the case was about the, the menses um, and a drug that had, been, uh, that had been discovered in England, where, for example, if a lady was missing on that, she could take that drug and within 25, 24 hours, um, that will show. And if it doesn't show, uh, the company put itself out there to say it shall be paid. It, it shall pay whoever does not get the menses in 24 hours after using the drug. And it said, if you don't get, go for a pregnancy test. That's what the company said. And the case was before Lord Denning. The introduction that Lord Denning gave to that case, the context that he gave to that case shocked me because as a man, I had never thought like that. Um, it was so sharp and accurate um, in, in, in the challenges that the ladies face. And he, he berated the company for taking advantage of a problem women face every month to make money out of it. And that uh, um, the company was not sensitive to them. And so he awarded a lot of damages to the woman that had come to court complaining that he had been duped by that drug that the company made. Um, the depth 
of understanding of women issues in that regard was so deep that I was concerned that Lord Lenin must be a special man. But when I did my research, I actually discovered that he consulted his wife on that. And that uh, it is his wife who um, had instructed him on, on how women experience that particular um, problem. So yes, Ongoya, it is possible that through research methods, for example, interviews, an author can get a deep and insightful uh, perspective on a certain problem. But I always think that the, the writer remains secondary um, if they're speaking about issues that don't affect them directly. So for example, a man writing about menses will be close, but will never get it right. A woman writing about maybe forced circumcision among men, boys circumcision in Bukusuland, might never get the story. They can write about it, but they will never be completely on point. A Kenyan writing about Red Indians um, will never get the story. Um, I remember that once I was in Australia for some time on a fellowship, and I meet the indigenous communities, some of them as black as ourselves. Um, they have put camp near government offices, and they, they have put fire, they, 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 they they light the fire every day for several years, I can't remember, but uh, it was several years, demonstrating against the violations of their rights. Um, I tried to have a conversation with them uh, because I thought that as an African person, I could connect to any other marginalized person in, in the world. Um, to my surprise, those people could not connect to me and I ended up not understanding what they were saying at all. Um, number one, Australia is a very developed country with a lot of opportunities. Um, they have liberal provisions for these indigenous communities, a lot. In fact, you can't start a meeting like this in Australia without referring to the indigenous communities um, that were generous enough to allow other people to live with them. They, there are a lot of concessions in their laws and constitution to the indigenous communities, but they still complain. Any Kenyan community would want to be where they are you know, but they still complain. And I figured that I will never understand them. Um, I also, when working for human rights uh, communities when I was younger, uh, younger professional, uh, was trying to put together Kenyan communities, um, persons with disability, uh, communities of persons with disability in Kenya to get their position because I was making a parallel report that we were presenting to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And I tried to speak to them. Um, and for the first time, it occurred to me that it was very difficult for me to connect with them, first and foremost. But secondly, that they could not connect to each other. Um, there were persons with disability that, for example, have a mental challenge. There are those that have, um, maybe they, they can't walk um, normally like the other people. Uh, maybe they don't have one leg or the other. Uh, or the others who are blind or the others could not uh, hear without an aid or hear, could not hear completely, or the others just had albinism. Uh, between themselves or among themselves, it is difficult to get consensus on any aspect. It's impossible. In fact, the meetings I, uh, I summoned or organized did not bear any fruit. I, I don't think I got, any, I got anything out of that. Because for example, um, persons with this kind of disability thought that the other persons with this kind of disability were favored, or persons with this other disability thought that the others were not very serious, uh, you know? And, 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 and it, it began to make me uh, conscious of being outside, the others, the otherness, and that it is always good to defer um, to those who are experiencing a particular problem and that their voice should be heard more strongly than the voices of the others. And rightly so, I think, Ongoya, that those who are in between a problem have much more insights about that problem. And that a foreigner writing about your country, unless they're very skilled in research methods, will obviously miss out on certain nuances, which is the case with this article. Um, I actually think that the author missed out on fundamentals and made serious assumptions. I think I highlighted some of them. The most obvious is to think that decolonizing is surface. It is not, it is deeper is to think that Africans can only learn from India, and again, um, it is deeper, is to ignore serious challenges 
of, for example, access to justice and that the law remains an elite traditional profession is to miss out that even this liberal tradition of Bill of Rights and Constitutions and litigation is actually part of the uh, middle class liberal democracy concepts, which are not necessarily friendly to the Africans. Um, and, and, and I think that a proper African writing on this aspect would have gotten that kind of um, context right, even to begin with. Um, what else am I missing here? Um, yes, Ongoy also mentions about um, some of our traditional mechanisms or methods of justice can be draconian. I agree, but I also say some of the Western methods of justice can also be dra draconian. Um, we'll notice that death sentence, which is quite colonial as we know it today here, um, is still enforced in America. Our courts have been reluctant to kill it through jurisprudence. The authors of our constitution before the courts were even more reluctant to kill death penalty. And so we end up in a very fluid situation where death penalty is still exercised in Kenya. Of course, judges have recently tried to make to, to water it down, that judges need to have discretion, so that it's not the only penalty, that you could have a lesser one where there are mitigating factors and stuff like that. Um, but death penalty is more cruel than taking away somebody's hand, in my view. Um, and I want us to picture um, the story, assuming that we are talking about Cain and, Cain and Abel and Adam. I don't know that Adam had other children, but it seems they had. Uh, but Cain and Adam, Cain and Abel and Adam. So Adam has two sons and one kills the other. If Adam was living in the society today, um, Cain would have been taken through a criminal process. And in that criminal process, he would have been found guilty and condemned to death, you were convicted. Um, and so um, Cain would also have died. Remember, he has already killed Abel and Adam remains without a child. I'm assuming there were two, I don't know. I, I, I get different stories that there could be more children for Adam. But I'm just assuming that Adam has two children or an African man, uh, Ogola, has two sons, Omondi and Otieno, and Otieno kills Omondi. And when it goes to court, even Otieno is killed. So Mr. Ogola has no son. Or Mrs. Ogola has no son. They all, both have been killed through these fair methods that Ongoa is talking about, the Western method, uh, the modern legal system. It isn't fair at all as well. So what I'm saying in other words is that both systems have challenges. Both systems have their problems. Uh, but the solution is not to throw away a system entirely uh, because there are some challenges. I think what we need to do is to study our African methods, uh, traditional dispute resolution mechanisms, um, to study our culture, our customary law, to see what is there that is rich. I think that would be a good starting point. And to see what is there that is not very good. And to start seeing whether there is emerging consensus of values, which there is, for example, um, treating people humanely, um, not being, um, not indignifying people, not torturing people. There are values that we are having consensus about, not just at the global front, but even as our own people, as we interact between ourselves and other visitors that we have among us and as the civilizations change and grow, I think we are learning a lot of values in the process. And, and, and I think it is possible that those values can be breathed down into our societies and communities. That's what I'm saying in other words. So by decolonizing, I don't just mean that we go back to African culture in 1720, no. Uh, I mean that we assess ourselves to see what is there among us and we see what we have learned that is new, that is nice and also take it on board and shed off whatever we have that is negative and kill it completely. That, that, that's the kind of method I, I, is to go for Western methods, which are equally not good, and to call ours repugnant to justice and morality. I think I have serious challenges with that. I hope, Luciana, I, I have given a response to those initial issues that were raised. Yes, you have, Dr. Ari. Asante Sana. Um, allow me to also thank everybody who has joined us on Facebook. We are streaming live on Facebook. 
Um, in particular, allow me to thank uh, Christy Mediva and Jacqueline Ngutia, and also uh, JV Owiti from the ODPP for JV Owiti for joining us for this session as well. Thank you also to my colleagues, Mr. Gekombe, American Yanjui, and of course our senior Edition Goya, who have also joined us for this session. Uh, we're really grateful for your presence. There were some hands which were up and there's some comments on the chat and also on Facebook. So I'll start with Rachel, whose hand has been up for quite a bit, and then I'll take the comments which have been put on the chat. So Rachel, would you like to go ahead and make your intervention after which we'll hear from Marion Joy and then we'll take the comments on the chat? Okay, yeah, I would. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Um, I have several comments and uh, questions. Uh, um, Dr. Mbani has mentioned that um, we miss out or when an African, when a, a foreigner writes about Africa or um, we, they miss out on something. So I'm asking myself, are we not missing out also when speaking about decolonizing? So the deeper aspect of decolonizing uh, in regards to that, I asked myself, why decolonize in the first place? Whose duty is it to decolonize? Is it about identity? And you have mentioned we are not going back. Uh, so, uh, and if we were to look or to use um, the worldview that you're proposing or the methods of looking at what you can, you know, put forward and what you can leave behind, um, uh, uh, what will you go back to or where are we going back to in, in that sense? So um, in regards to us missing out and in answering the question, you know, whose duty is it? Uh, when one reads, for example, um, uh, Ngugi Wadi Ongo's uh, Decolonizing the Mind, or uh, we saw him in, when he was awarded an award earlier last year, he spoke in uh, Kikuyu, and I'm asking myself, did he not speak because he's in a position of privilege? In saying that, I mean, an upcoming artist or a writer cannot do that because he or she will lose, uh, will lose, um, um, the market or, or his audience. So in order to reach out the greater international market or audience, he has to speak or she has to speak in English. When you talk about the Mitumba Center, now people are, are talking about decolonizing, you know, what we are wearing. People are, are, are shifting to wearing African clothes. So for the privileged man, it's cheaper for him to buy such clothes as opposed to uh, the ordinary Kenyan who will prefer to buy a mitumba for 10 shillings or 20 shillings. So are we not missing out in that aspect in regards to that Karl Marx, Marx say that those in, who are to decide in any society are those who are less privileged. So whose duty, according to you, is it to decolonize uh, all these aspects of our lives uh, when one listens to or reads the speech by Chinua Achebe, whose uh, philosophy I subscribed to in 1962, he says that he couldn't at the time read Shaban Roberts. Those who have read Shaban Roberts is a great a Swahili writer. He couldn't read it because at, at the time he was writing in Kiswahili or in Swahili. So according to Achebe, he says, and he concluded, he concludes his speech called English and the African author. And he says that for him, he will continue writing in English because the question to ask here is not whether an African writer should write or not write in English, but is whether an African writer ought to write or not write in English. So mm -hmm. in regards to, to the deeper aspect of decolonizing, we look at it in every aspect. When we talk about religion, what does it mean to decolonize religion? What does it mean to decolonize our language? What does it mean to decolonize our political structure? In fact, what does it mean to decolonize jurisprudence? Do we talk about the court system? Do we talk about the, which is perhaps more easier, you know, books, uh, jurisprudential books, you can just write in Swahili or choose what and what not. So um, my thoughts on this, I subscribe, as I said, to Achebo, who is a more liberal um, person in approaching the question of decolonizing and um, in his ideas of the same. So for me, I, I think I would like to really hear your, your opinion on why do we decolonize in the first place. And also you said something about you know, environmental rights. Are we not, uh, are we really sparing our environment or 
are we not added to where the white man's man is going, you know? Uh, or is that now? Isn't it the dream of most Africans to, you know, become a white state? Uh, in this regard, I hold a very controversial view. I, I, in fact, call us not Africans. I call us Black Europeans because at the end of the day, we really try to, you know, achieve what the white man has achieved throughout his life. And this is what Franz Fanon refers to in his book, The Wretched of the Earth. It says for Africa to go ahead, we need to uh, this, to sever the relationship between the colonial bourgeoisie and the colonized intellectuals who perhaps it, it referred to us today. You know, we speak in English, we, we read um, um, English books and we subscribe more to the Western culture. So at the end of the day, I don't know, should we decolonize or should we just, um, you know, the show must go on for, for Africa and Africa, mm. that's all. Okay, L thank you, thank you, Rachel. Yes. Luciana, I can, I'll appreciate yes. if um, I can respond to Rachel before we go to any other not a problem and i think that's the same thing that jv ovt is asking on facebook he's asking as a starting point why decolonize jurisprudence what are we trying to achieve i think that's roughly along the same lines as rachel's questions maybe you can take that together with with rachel's questions okay and uh after i speak i don't know that lizzie is here and melissa i'm old and i'm too old to to know where they are on this chart I will appreciate if they yes, can they um, feed in where, yeah, if they can jazz uh, uh, where there will be gaps. Um, is this the same ratio that did a video for us in the day we celebrated the constitution? Yes. The voice is familiar. Yes, it's me. Rachel, are you the same one? Yes, I am. Oh, good, good, good to see you on this platform. That was very nice. We, we, we really loved, and many people loved the video you made um, when we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Constitution. I'm quite excited that you are still within reach. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Luciana, why I asked to, to respond at this point is because I think um, I also was doing injustice to imagine that we were on the same point uh, mm -hmm. on the question of the colonization, especially jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, last year, I was on a platform in Oxford um, to discuss African jurisprudence. I think I shared it with you, Luciana, and Ongoya mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I, can, yeah, yeah. I can share with you so that you can go further to other people. The link to uh, the video was taken of that debate. And um, the Oxford, uh, I think it is Bonavero Institute, had asked me and a few and a professor in South Africa to respond to the question, is there such a thing as African jurisprudence, for example? Um, what would it have if it was there? You know, how different would it be from say the Western jurisprudence that we all imbibe on a daily basis? Um, and I think I should use some of the ideas. These are my ideas, but also I stand on the shoulders of giants like Mazrui when I make them, um, because I, I, Michelle uh, Mugong, I, I have read a bit on what they are saying on these aspects, uh, including Achebe, um, and I've come up with my own ideas about what I think is to decolonize, um, what I think is the problem, and how to go forward with it. Um, one of the next major projects I have is to write a book on African jurisprudence. Uh, because I stopped teaching. I'm happy Gekombe is here. When I was his teacher, I used to teach students. And students would ask me, um, don't we have Africans that have also written jurisprudence? Because if you're not careful in a jurisprudence curriculum, you might start with those people, old ones, Plato, Cicero, St. Thomas Aquinas, Hart, Fuller, and you might end up not talking about an African at all. And I began to question myself. And uh, as I questioned myself, I realized people like Mandela had written serious things that were actually jurisprudential. 
uh, for those who have doubt, if you look at, say, the Rivonia trial speech, that is jurisprudence. Um, Lizzie here was telling me about the fact that she cited um, um, Ken Sarawiwa's African Kills Her Son in her dissertation. For, for those young people who are interested, please look for it. It's just a short story. Africa Kills Her Son. Um, look at it and see how much jurisprudence comes out of that article. Uh, but before I start talking in circles, allow me, allow me to say um, that African jurisprudence for me would be that jurisprudence um, that recognizes that Africa has a history. Um, and that history of Africa is one that is alive to a few experiences that has dented um, the lives of the African peoples. Just let me mention a few of those major experiences. Number one, slavery. Africans were taken from here to the West, to the, you know, to the Americas, you know, to use their strength, skills, and resources to build those civilizations. Arabs also took our slaves. Um, one of your teachers, Omolo, uh, was, is, was reading a book recently um, about how Arabs took us to Yemen to work there, you know. Um, if you've been to Ghana, you know that lots of Africans were taken to Americas through there to go and work for them. And a lot of what is claimed as American success was actually built on our own energy and shoulders. So yes, African jurisprudence must account for that, slavery. African jurisprudence must account for another epoch, colonialism, and the effects that had on our people and welfare. Um, that a foreign civilization came here, imposed itself on us, um, took every effort to suppress us, took every effort to undermine our way of life, okay, and replace it with portions of what was theirs. And meanwhile, to subject us to a lot of human rights violations, including displacements, torture, killings, and actually being voiceless in government, um, in, the, in the governments that they established. That is called the colonial epoch. And again, African jurisprudence must be alive to what that epoch did to us. What was the impact of that? Uh, was it always good to us? Was it always bad to us? I think African jurisprudence must interrogate that. But once they left, again, they continued to do what we called uh, neocolonialism. And at the moment, the height of it is globalization, complete with the internet. Um, I was just finishing uh, consulting uh, for another school within Strathmore. They're making a journal on uh, intellectual property and international communication law. Is it called that? Yeah, something like that. International, in, in, uh, no, information communication technology law. And you have challenges like, say, YouTube. YouTube is worldwide, but pays no taxes to our government. Have you ever thought about that? They're using our resources. If you have ever posted content, I have content on YouTube, including my classes and my works in art. Um, YouTube makes money on that because people come to visit, they do adverts, they never pay taxes to any African government. That is neocolonialism. And there are now new structures that look mild, appear very mild and innocent, but they're actually structures through which another form of colonialism is possible, okay? Um, so an African jurisprudence must be alive to those realities, that structures are in place even now to continue to oppress us, to continue to enslave us, and to use our resources and wealth um, to enrich other people, not ourselves. So that is what I call decolonizing, being alive to that and coming out of that, being sensitive to every sign of those kind of systems and methods. Um, I hope I'm, I'm clear, Rachel, about what I mean by the colonial structures and how to decolonize. I think, I think that's what I mean. But do I mean that we go back to African cultures, the round house without a window, uh, the, the round hut without a window, um, to maybe polygamy, to maybe child sacrifice, or some of the values we had that some of you think are and toward, do I mean that we go back there? 
certainly not. Um, what I mean instead is, and, and here is why Ali Mazru is my um, uh, conceptual framework for the works they do in public law. Uh, what I mean is to accept that an Africa, an African was there before this interaction with foreigners, um, to find out what the African was. Um, to find out what an African has become because of interaction with other people. And the new people we have interacted with have come as visitors, um, um, uh, have come as missionaries. And I'm thinking about, for example, the Portuguese, they came here quite early. The Arabs and their Sultanates, they came here quite early. The Christians and their missionaries, the Arabs and their Islam, Hindus and the Asians, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of interaction with foreigners. And recently, um, now we shall probably have as many Chinese as maybe the Indians in, in our land. And we are learning and, and, and we are civilizing um, their, their societies and they are civilizing ours as well, I think. So it is cross civilizational interchange. I think that's what we have. So for me, the way forward is to take positives, to learn from each other and to grow what we have. Uh, but you, you see, you can't learn without knowing what you have. So we must know residually what is ours. And then what have we accepted through interaction? And I sort of prefer the lessons we learn through cross-cultural exchange rather than through imposition, such as those we learn through colonialism, you see? Uh, so for example, the Indians have been here with us and we have learned a lot from them. I talked about chai, for example, being an Asian concept, even the tea itself. Um, I talked about rice be, having been brought here probably by the Portuguese, or maize. Uh, I hear lawyers saying that maize is their staple, or, or that waru is the staple of kikuyus. All those things have been brought here uh, by mostly the Portuguese during their time, and the Indians have brought their stuff, wheat and the chapati and all those good things. But you see, they were not imposed on us. We learned and liked them, and they're now part of our civilization. I have no problem with that. But I have a problem where there is forceful conquest, and we are forced to abandon what we like, to take up something we don't like. Or that through treachery um, and cunningness, somebody introduces something to us, say, through internet, nudity, for example. And I know African cultures um, were always uh, for some form of nudity. Um, the Trukana women, for example, walking bare chest. But it's not the same as packaging yourself as a socialite um, and then selling your bodies on the internet to all that are willing to buy that kind of immorality. That's quite different. Um, and I think Africans must be careful in what they learn, how they learn it, and therefore move their cultures forward by learning and cross-learning and cross-civilizing and then moving forward along those paths. That's what I call decolonization. I hope Rachel is with me on this. So I don't mean that we just take ours and take away the others, no. Um, this Zoom meetings must continue. Uh, I'm sure Zoom wasn't invented by an African. The computer wasn't invented by an African, but those are platforms we can use to continue our cross-civilizational experiences. And that's what I call decolonizing. I hope, I hope I've defined the two parameters uh, from where I sit. Um, in terms of um, language, and, 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 and you said Nguiki Wationgo did that because of his status. Yes, I agree. Sometimes you have to fight because of your status. And, and many battles are fought by people with status. In fact, battles cannot be fought by people without status. Um, the people you shout about, like Mandela, Mandela himself was royalty, I'm sure you know, um, and that he was king already. In fact, Mandela ran away uh, from uh, a royal throne and a royal wife he had been given to go to Johannesburg and ends up liberating the whole South Africa. Um, the, li the likes of Mazrui, who are our champions um, in, 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 in uh, Pan-Africanism, uh, also royal at the coast, because you know the Mazrui family is a big family there. Uh, the father of our constitution, Yash Palgai, was only able to be the father of the constitution because he was also Asian and had the privilege of studying law, including going to the UK to study. So yes, a position of privilege is a good vantage point to fight for your people. And I don't think it is good to criticize Ngugi for this. Um, it is good that he has taken that opportunity to fight for our interest 
and rights because he has the privilege to do that. But before you think that Ngugi has done this recently, um, I hope you remember that Ngugi, while at the University of Nairobi Literature Department, um, um, walked out of lecture halls and went to Lemuru, started the Kamerutu uh, theater groups where he would meet these women and young people in the communities and they would act in Kikuyu. And in fact, Gugi only became dangerous to the Kenyatta regime when Kenyatta realized, and more later, that Ngugi was not just talking to elites who were going to drink their lives away. Um, no, he was actually talking to communities that could transform into a serious political force. That is when Gugi was dangerous. That is when he was taken to exile. So you are actually more dangerous when you connect your scholarship or your activism with communities. Um, I hope that again responds to the question that you asked. The other issue you raised was uh, relating to language, but differently. So should we abandon English as a language? And Melissa will help me there, because there are two schools of thought here. One by Ngugi, that let's go to our Kikuyu, to our Luya, to our Kisi, to our Jaluo, to our Kalenjin, let's go to our languages uh, and, and, and explore them. That is fine. But there's also the other side of, Ngugi, of, of Chinua Achebe, Michele Mugo, and they have been saying that we can actually Africanize this English and take over it and make it ours. And that's what Ngugi Wationgo has done. That's what Michele Mugo has done. In fact, I find that English is far more malleable um, than perhaps the African communities themselves. And, and, and I think that's another approach that I also approve of. So for me, I'm easy um, both ways. Use English, use vernacular, but have the substratum in mind. The substratum is to decolonize um, along the parameters that I've indicated. Um, finally, you also talked about the environment. And I want to reiterate that the pollution on large scale is a colonial or Western concept, and nowadays also Eastern. It's an Eastern phenomenon, and we must be alive to that reality. Um, a decolonizing mind must be asking for carbon points from Western and Eastern powers because of their responsibility in polluting our environments. I want to, I want to ask you a few questions. How many phones have you bought since uh, you became an adult? You're probably very young, but I'm sure you've had three, four phones already. Where did you throw them? How many computers have you had or your schools have had? Where were they thrown? And who earned from the computer when you bought it? Who made it? Um, so while you might look at a pile of plastic, a pile of non-degradable material in a dump site in Kenya, in Dandora, in Nakuru or wherever, and think that this is African pollution, um, I want to testify to you today that 90% of the pollution you see is Western and Eastern. It is gadgets, it is, uh, um, you know, material, it is industries that are making things here, but belong to multinationals that are making profits in the Western world. Though you see it here, it is not for here. Or a local one, that has bought foreign machines and making things using local raw materials for export to the West or for um, exploitation of the people right here. And so whichever way you look at environmental pollution, it will remain a Western concept and those are the people that are supposed to pay for it. So a decolonizing mind must be alive to those realities of who is doing what, where. In terms of who will liberate us, it is all of us Africans, but it must be laid by those who are knowledgeable. Um, the ordinary person might not be aware of what we are speaking today. Um, if you think I know something about this, it's because I've invested a lot of time um, reflecting on the colonization. A lot of time, I can assure you. I uh, just didn't wake up to start talking about the colonization. It's something I've reflected upon. And like I said, I'm writing stuff, and I've been writing a lot of stuff already about this. I hope that helps, Luciana. And I can appreciate if my two colleagues on this forum can help chip in where they think I fell short. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. I think the question of language is one of the ones that has elicited the most comments. 
Someone is actually asking, yeah. um, just continuing along the lines of Nigeria, which have adopted pidgin, can we adopt Sheng as part of judicial language? Do you see that evolution happening as part of the um, decolonization process? Um, but there's also, a con uh, JV is very grateful with the feedback you've given them around what colonization is, but I think his question is, he's not quite clear on the end goal of decolonization. What are we seeking to achieve? What is the why? And he's asking, how do we ensure that decolonizing our culture and jurisprudence does not go contrary to the continued globalization of law and jurisprudence, which is made even more necessary and possible by technology? So how do we ensure that decolonizing our culture and jurisprudence does not go contrary to the continued globalization of our law and jurisprudence made more necessary and possible by technology? Um, there's also a question around customary law and how, how we can remove this code and reconcile contradictory elements between customary law and Western laws, and particularly because customary law is now an integral part of our law. How do we remove discord and reconcile contradictory elements between customary and Western laws? Um, Dr. Deche, thank you for joining us, is asking, um, how do we achieve a balance between decolonization on one hand, uh, which is a good thing, and, but avoid over-romanticization of African cultural norms as if they are perfect? Um, she would like to see how that balance will be struck. That you talked about cross-cultural exchange. I'd come again about this. So she's asking, how do we achieve a balance between colonization, decolonization on one hand and of a romanticization of African cultural norms as if they were perfect? How is that balance to be struck? Mm -hmm. I hope that's clear, Dr. Tari. Yeah, very clear. Yeah, and then Mr. Kadima would like to know, thank you, Cedric, for always being a part of this. He'd like to know, what will be the performance indicators that we have finally decolonized jurisprudence? In 10, 50, 100 years, what are the performance indicators for decolonization? Um, Christy, I believe, also had a question, but, and Marion Joy as well. Shall I allow Dr. Ambani to take those and then we can come to those two, if that's okay? That is fine by me, but I would ask, Melissa, do you want to say something? You want me to respond to the questions or? Anything, any, any aspect that you have had so far or any question? Okay, so um, yeah, this discussion has been very bright and inciting, so. The one that's come to mind is a lot of the participants, and and could be wrong, seem to have this fear of the aspect of decolonization when it came from your mouth. <laughs> but when it came from uh, Dr. Elizabeth, they were, yes, yes, this is great. This is fantastic. I loved the article. So it's something that we haven't owned yet. And I liked the question on whose duty is it to decolonize. So at the moment, I'm in a fantastic class full of students from all over Africa, from Malawi, Zimbabwe, um, Uganda, and Madagascar, some on the way. We talk about Ivory Coast. And the whole, um, I mean, the, 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 what is the word? The linking factor is that everybody has faced in one way or another an identity crisis owing to the fact that they don't know who they are. Their, histories, their histories were disrupted at some point. Their cultures were disrupted at some point. Even as we speak about language, even our intellectual might, we get a bit confused with certain concepts. We don't like to own what is, what is ours. You know, you, you, you tend to, it's a fragility. Let me use that word, it's a fragility where you're not sure you can surpass a particular barrier. So I'm, I, I want to say Africa arise, you know, avid readers arise, you know, you can do it. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of, of something that is foreign to you because that is exactly what um, decolonial studies tend to do, to break barriers and show you possibilities. I want to answer the question potentially. I know I won't get it fully, but on the why are we decolonizing? I think I'd call it social justice. All this time we've been talking about a world where there's a lot of 
um, violations and threats to our person, to our identities, to how we view ourselves, to how our generations are coming, you know, in the future are going to view themselves. You can't imagine a world where there's something rosy and rainbows and butterflies and whatnot. So I would call it social justice. And social justice defined um, as, as how Prof has said, you have to acknowledge where you've come from and the struggles that are here. So I'd actually call it uh, a, a striving for justice in a world of struggle, struggle from the technological aspect, the environmental aspect, ETC, all these aspects that form who we are today. And it's a struggle, as he said, it's a fight. It's something that you need to have some tenacity over. And it's so easy to look for clues on how to do it. Someone asked about indicators. Look at a particular aspect. Prof has done so well in giving us the varieties of life from the Mitumba market that Rachel was asking about, to our languages, to how we instruct in universities, to fora such as this, like avid readers or, or the one at Strath called the Hat. Um, to, to our, uh, the advocates, the careers that we choose in the legal field, the judges who are here with us. So um, look for these clues in literature as, as, as Lizzie did in her dissertation. Look for these clues in your, now we like using this word nowadays as a group, epistemic communities. <laughs> these are like-minded people who are thinking about decolonial studies, you won't find it reading Elizabeth's mismatched article that I say should be disregarded, even in the spacings <laughs> and the commas, disregard it. Um, it is in people who are studying a specific aspect of this issue. Like I love Ambrina Manji's, Professor Ambrina Manji's book on land, The Struggles for Justice in Kenya, um, Land Justice in Kenya. Look at how she brings up the sociological aspects that Prof has been talking about. People power, look at activism. What are the people on the street saying? Why are they chaining themselves up to the court? Ongoya was talking about going to um, um, coast and seeing how they deliberate among themselves in terms of uh, uh, what do you call it, dispute resolution. What does that speak to? Why are we afraid of what is our own? You in yourselves <laughs> are all sites of knowledge, and this is what Michelle Mungo talks about, and also Isa Shibji. You are sites of liberation in yourselves, how you conduct yourself every day, how you speak to another person, that aspect of humanity. This is all decolonization, and it is not only an African issue, it is a global issue. In Europe and Australia and America, you've seen how they treat people on the margins, on the fringes. It is a struggle. So maybe don't be confused by the colonial in the sense that we are used to the struggle and partition, you know. But there are appendages of, you know, cradle of Africa, <laughs> cradle of mankind in Africa and where most of the injustices in terms of slavery began, we are spread out all over. Think also of Pan-Africanism. Why are people struggling to put the continent together? There's a commonality in our stories. So the why surpasses Kenya, surpasses Africa. It's a global issue. And even when we confront globalization, just because some countries right now have rights in space, in the moon, you know, don't think that it not, it's not going to be tied to or linked to the same struggles of decolonization because it will always be a question of why is it them and not some people in the margins who don't have the right to be themselves, self-determination to you know, achieve certain issues that they, they want to achieve in their livelihoods, etc, etc. So the why I call it social justice, how to interact with one another as human beings and breaking down barriers, and it is an active fight. It is radical, it is intellectual, it is physical. <laughs> it is so many things, cultural, sociological, economic, the way Prof has been talking about it, it is many things. Do not be afraid, <laughs> thus says the Lord. <laughs> Do not be afraid, take charge, have some tenacity. Do not be afraid. This is um, something that is going to follow you for the rest of your life. Wherever you go and hide, decolonization will find you. <laughs>
Great, great. Thank you, Melissa. Well spoken. Um, well spoken. Lizzie, do you want to say something before I say mine? Yes, 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 I would. Um, well, I, I want to start just where Melissa left off and to address something that came up by two of my listeners. I don't think we should ever put down the question. I can't hear you properly. Can you move to your mic? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, as I was saying, I'm going to start off on the issue of identity. And in my opinion, identity in the sense of, I think we can sometimes get the idea that identity is, a, is an ephemeral question. It's not so important. It's like something people think about once all the basic things have been sorted. I don't believe uh, We can't hear you. Can you not? I can't hear you. Put, put it there, there. Put it in your mouth, yeah. Can everyone else hear me? Yes, we can. Lizzie. Okay. okay. So, so. Just improve on your audio. Oh. Yes, yes. Improve on your audio. You are speaking from a distance. Yes. Really? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now? Now it's good. Fine. Okay. Oh, okay. So as I was saying, um, identity, in my opinion, is basic and is the driver behind pretty much everything we do, the kind of things we are trying to create in this world, they are because of a certain way we want to think of ourselves and of our societies and what we want to achieve. And uh, when it comes to the question of identity, I don't know whether, I think I will speak for majority of us that ever since you, you gain consciousness of yourself as a person, you're always aiming for elsewhere. It's, the where you are is never enough. And it's worse off when you're an African. Because you're always trying to get to another place, not here, all the time. What will it mean for us to say our here matters, our being as the people we actually are in itself matters? We do not constantly have to yearn and to go look for somewhere else, for someone else to be. I think that's what decolonization means to me. Where we start from, starting from ourselves. So for example, in this, in this uh, paper, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. yes we can. Good, 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 good. So, so as I was saying, uh, the starting point of this paper, for example, is what I find to be the starting point for majority of all intellectual discussions that happen about Africa. Emphasis on the about. It's always African jurisprudence. So you start from the general, which never starts here, it always starts in the West, and then the question becomes, okay, so what about Africa? Same thing uh, Dr. Elizabeth did. She begins with uh, what has been happening about locus standi elsewhere, and then says, well, here's a peculiarity in um, post-colonial countries. Why do I have to be an afterthought? I am tired of being an afterthought. I want to think about law, to think about life, where I am the starting point, where we are the starting point. I don't think that's even a radical idea because for God's sake, the West does it all the time. They don't start out saying, okay, let's talk about jurisprudence. Hmm, what did Mr. Ambani say? No, they will begin with Austin because he speaks to their situation. He speaks to the lives that they live. Why do we always have to be a small subset of the knowledge that the world creates? I refuse that starting point. So agreeing with Prof, for me, decolonization is about where we start from, starting from where we are, what our lives needs, and what our situations are. And so, for example, uh, when it comes to uh, the why, that big question, I I'd like to use a an example. I think all almost all of us, if you've gone to court, you've perchance encountered it. When you see a normal, regular person come into court, one who is not a lawyer, and how confused they are by the whole process. I once, uh, last year, I went to court and um, there was this, uh, this man who was, did not have representation because he could not afford it. And there was a discussion about the things he should have filed and when he should have filed them and his failure to do so. And all through it, you can see, first of all, the fear that is inherent in encountering state power in all its forms, even in courts that we can think of as being the good ones. 
the alienation of it all, the place where you're supposed to go for refuge, because for God's sake, you're not going to go to parliament or to Uhuru for your refuge. The courts are at least the place you can go to for refuge, the very place that we are calling revolutionary uh, for allowing people to go there. But you go there and the language is ab initio alienating. And then comes the position of us advocates uh, as the bridge between these two, but because again, a question of identity because of th that elitism that comes with that position, we do not recognize how the responsibility. Uh, I'm not. I'm speaking very generally. Of course, there are people who do the responsibility of being a translator between this legal world that people need to speak to to live and their realities that they are trying to express. And because we're caught up in privilege and you know the learned Frenchness, you you do not see that that bridge. And that's, what, why do I want to, to decolonize? I want to not have to stand in between my grandmother and the rest of the world so that she can make sense. I want her to make sense and then I make sense after her. I don't know whether you, you get what I'm saying because the way things are arranged right now, the world, I don't, the, the flow of power like if you come from a traditional background, is so disrupted. Where you have us young people who have to sit down and speak authoritatively with power to older people because the systems where they come from, where the power rests, and the systems we live in our regular day lives cannot exist at the same time as this system of law and power that we live in. And so we end up being powerful and having to advise people whose lives we should all be in awe of and sit down and, and listen to. I, I think my, my thoughts are scattered, but I want them, I want our lives to make sense, not as a secondary thought. The first place we go to when we say jurisprudence, I want it to be, okay, the hawker on the street. What, what, what is their problem? What, why, should, why should we speak about law in the first place? If it does not include them, or includes them as an afterthought, or as an eccentric thing that we study because, oh, the world is, then I don't want it. Starting point should be us. End point should be us. And it is, it is within such a framework that then how we encounter the law becomes a question of strategy. As Melissa said, this is a battle. And in a battle, we are not, we are not trying to find camaraderie with the tools we are using. You, know, you, you do not form a, an intimate relationship with a gun you're using in a war. The, the law is a gun. We use it to fight the war, but I, I do not think of it as something that we should venerate, especially through the history that we've lived, we've lived through it and that was made possible by the application of foreign law here, which continues up to date. I think um, the, last, the last thing I'd like to talk about is, um, oh yeah, this question of, of the rom romanticization of the African past. Again, I think this comes from the view of from a static point of we are here within a Western epistemology, how do we move back? But if we, I'm not talking about theory, I'm talking about like real life facts. The things that we're talking about decolonizing, like Prof was talking about, these are not stories of Kitambo, these are real life problems. And in that way, it, there's no romance to it. When we say, I need person A, B, C, D to be able to understand the law in a simple language, we need the law to work for them. It's not about ages long past now there's no romance to it there's a practicality to it and a dignity to it that is here and now so yeah i think that's that's about everything i have to say about you okay thank you thank okay. you lizzie dr ambani uh, in the interest of time can i just take the final two comments and then you can respond on 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 all of it and and wind up for us okay Okay. okay. Thank um, you. Christy had a hand up and so did Marion Joy. Christy Midiva, can we kindly take your intervention now and Marion Joy and then we can allow Dr. Tari to close for us. Mr. Ongoy, I see your hand is up as well. Thank you so much, Luciana. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Uh, probably uh, mine is just uh, to probably just add up on what Dr. Tari has said, what Dr. Ambani has said. And I mean, when you talk about um, decolonization, I'm very much involved in decolonizing the UK. So I tend to attend very many projects and, to, and also get involved in a lot of decolonize the UK projects. So, I mean, I think uh, 
probably if you look at uh, Dr. Mbani's school of thought, which I pretty much agree with and which I completely relate with, yeah? I think for a better understanding, or rather my school of understanding on what exactly decolonization is, I call it decol, yeah? Um, I mean, more often than not, and especially from my kind of school of thought, uh, I tend to um, look at um, uh, things in terms of, you know, uh, what exactly uh, do the Western, you know, the Western countries and, and the global North countries say vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the global South countries. So for me, more often than not, when I talk about decolonization, I tend to favor uh, countries in the global South, yeah? So um, as opposed to the Western or rather, um, uh, as opposed to the Western countries or even the global North countries, they themselves, yeah? So I tend to look at uh, what exactly are African countries saying, what exactly are the Asian countries uh, saying, what exactly is South America, you know, Mexico, what exactly are, are, they, are they saying as opposed to the Western uh, countries? And so even when you talk about uh, decolonization in itself, uh, more often than not, I tend to look at it in terms of the mind itself, yeah? And I tend to look at the different epistemologies, yeah? Because I tend to look at, you know, how exactly are people thinking and what exactly is, influ is influencing the school of thought, yeah? The moment for me, a school of thought is largely influenced by the Western uh, countries. I mean, for me, it's normally I shy away from it, yeah? And for instance, maybe I'll try and take you through... um. An example, like the feminist methodologies in, in themselves. Yeah? When you talk about literature and in terms of uh, the feminist methodologies uh, in the academia itself. Yeah, and, and, and for me, I tend to look at, uh, let us, for instance, look at the issue about gender and, and, you know, and gender in the African context. Yeah, if you look at even the writings that are done by, you know, by the Western countries um, in terms of gender in Africa and trying to evaluate, you know, gender problems in Africa, they tend to look at the Western feminist methodologies methodologies while in Africa we actually do have African feminism which is likely to solve the issues that they're trying to write about. So for me when I talk about decolonization, I mean as much as yes we do appreciate the Western uh, school of thought, the Western uh, epistemologies and such things, yeah, I try to share away from them so much because um, I, I mean, I mean, for me, I've always said, uh, or rather, I come from the school of thought that that you know that Africa is our business, uh, and you know, and we can only solve the uh, African problems in such an African way. So it does not matter whether the Western country thinks that African literature has a problem or maybe African research methodologies do have a problem. But listen, uh, 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 it's only African methodolog methodologies that we do associate ourselves with, yeah? I mean, we do understand ourselves from an African sort of setting, and as such, we can only solve those problems from the inside through an African way. So, I mean, when we talk about decolonization, uh, try look at it in terms of, you know, of them epistemologies that have been put in place by the Western countries to try and, and, and I mean, solve the African problem. Just the same way Dr. Ambani said uh, when he started the session, the first thing that um, he criticized is actually the writer herself, you know, and I mean, this is a writer who is largely um, from the Western, the Western side, you know, of, of, of the world, yeah, and this is um, um, a writer who has been largely influenced by the Western academic um, um, epistemologies, and as such, she is trying to solve an African problem, probably mm -hmm. using a Western school of thought, or rather she's trying to tell us that, you know what, uh, even having been brought up in, an, in a Western setting, I mean, I still know what the African problem is, or rather I can solve the African problem. I don't think she can. So, I mean, even myself, when, 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 when I saw that particular article, and I remember when I looked at it, and then I'm seeing the word decolonization, and then with the white man's face on it, I mean, for me, it was already, I uh, know, you know, for me, I thought, not at all. This is not decolonization at all from my understanding of what decolonization is or rather, you know, the different uh, people who believe in the whole decolonization um, movement. So, I mean, I completely agree with what Dr. Ambani is saying. Um, and, and, and I mean, I would encourage everyone. Um, I remember our writings or even 
our, you know, our thinking must not largely be influenced by the white man or rather the Western, the Western world. I still believe that, you know what, that Africa in itself can still solve, solve its problem. We do its problems. We do have very good African literature. We do have very, very good um, African written jurisprudence, you know, African theories that can largely influence our school of thought as opposed to us largely always relying on um, on the Western school of thought. And my research, um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently pursuing, pursuing my academics, yeah? And even as I do my PhD thesis, I keep on having a fight with my supervisors because I keep on telling them that, listen, yeah, I'm trying to digest the one third gender principle in Kenya. There is no way you expect me to use the Western um, uh, uh, feminist theories. It's just not going to work for me at all, yeah? That for me, I believe, you know, uh, I, uh, let me let me let me let me let me let me use uh, uh, the likes of Professor Kamiri Mbote's school of thought. Let me use uh, the likes of Mugabe Shere's school of thought. Let me use uh, the likes of Dr. Kihiro of Uganda's school of thought because I do think that my problem, you know, largely emanates from the African society. It's a it's a problem that is affecting the African society, the Kenyan society, and as such, it does have a historical uh, ground, you know, from a Kenyan perspective, and as such. You know, I can't be forced to use the Western theories because, you know, I mean, in writing, it's almost very certain that it's the Western academic writings that, you know, that is 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 accepted as the, you know, as probably, um, you know, I mean, when you when you do any academic writing, it's almost certain that it's the Western academic um, writing that, you know, that is accepted as the norm that is, you know, that is pretty much what is accepted as the norm, you know, when it comes to writing. But who said that? I mean, why can't I quote my African literature in peace, yeah? And why can't I largely just rely on African feminism? Because that is also a school of theory. So, I mean, um, as I've said, I completely agree with Dr. Ambani. I'm very, very passionate about the, the whole decolonization movement, extremely passionate about it. And until we own our own problems, we will always keep on allowing the Western, the Western world to try and, and solve them for us, which, I mean, shouldn't be the case at all. So thank you so much, Dr. Ambani, and even Melissa. You know, I loved, you know, Melissa's comment as well. As well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, Marion Joy, I believe your hand was up for a long time. I don't know whether you still want to make your intervention. Yes. All right. If you can kindly be brief, because we don't have a lot of time. Brian, Atonia as well. I'll just give you a minute each, kindly. Okay. Um, I have a question. Everyone talks about decolonizing in a sense to mean let's get done with the Western and Eastern but I just have a question. Should we be dismissing everything and anything just because it was first practiced in the West um, or East? Um, should we not be basing, I think we should be basing our dismissal of anything based on if it's right or wrong. Because now Rachel says um, conserving the environment is like black Europeanism. And should we now stop conserving the environment because Europeans try and conserve the environment. I mean, is it that it is um, a Western method or the West first used those methods? And also Dr. Ambani, just briefly, you talked about um, voting for a society where this uh, it's based on society rather than a developed system of governance like the government. Um, would you please a little bit expound on what you meant by that? Because, um, is it even practical in a society where people don't go around doing good for the sake of it? If they did that, we would not even need laws in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion Joy. Uh, Brian, are you able to articulate your intervention in a minute or less? Brian Atonia? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Kindly go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit concerned when we talk of African jurisprudence in the mm -hmm. sense that um, do we begin from jurisprudence, then we pro proceed to become Africans in our articulation of laws and society and how it applies those laws, or do we begin from being African and then the rest comes? Because uh, from the way we've been talking, it's as if we are doing away with the idea of our jurisprudence 
uh, and taking up something that uh, we have not yet articulated in the whole conversation. And, and, and I'm, 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 I'm um, getting defeated in the understanding of all the discussion around Africanism and um, jurisprudence and feminism, all these ideas that are coming up in the conversation. So which one takes precedence first? Is it our Africanism or is it the idea of a jurisprudence or, and its articulation within the African context or uh, what, what comes before what? I think that should come clear before we can, um, we can um, go through the whole process of jurisprudence or feminism or whatever we have within the discussion of today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So maybe Dr. Ari, I can ask you to take those and then um, close the discussion for us in the in the interest of time. I know we could go on for much longer, but I, I think I'm aware that we have been here for quite a while. So maybe you can take those interventions and then make your closing remarks for us. Asante. I hope I'll manage because I'm in, uh, I'm in shock in terms of the wisdom on this group. And just the amount of uh, uh, contribution and presence. I, I can't believe this is Africa. <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, both in terms of quality and quantity, I think it's quite exciting. And I think Kabarak must continue to do this. I'm so, just quite excited. I don't know where to start and end. Um, I try to note down issues as they, as they came. So permit me to speak randomly, but also very fast. I hope I still communicate. Why decolonization? I think there was such a question. Why are we even decolonizing? Eh? Um, allow me to say, um, and I think Lizzie said it so well also, is an issue of identity. If you have no identity, you are confused. Um, I, I know saying this to a group that is fast modernizing, what is modernizing? Fast globalizing, it doesn't make sense. Um, but I think one requires some order. When you wake up, it's good to know what time to wake up, isn't it? Is it good to eat a snack or a snail? Is it okay? You need to know that. Can you sleep with your mother? You need to know that, or your sister or brother. Can you put on clothes or walk naked? Um, how much clothes do you need? Um, can you kill the next person, your neighbor? Or you need direction, in other words. And jurisprudence gives you that kind of you know, uh, direction. I call it social jurisprudence. It orders you on daily basis. You just don't realize um, that there are a number of codes in your heart. And which is why I talked to Africans being dealt with at the heart level. Um, because there's a number of codes there that direct your life on daily basis. Um, what co colonization, uh, slavery, neocolonization, and globalization have done is to remove the African's identity so that the African does not understand themselves. Once you do not know the compass, um, you don't know north, then you can't navigate. That's what I mean. Um, we don't have a constant north uh, because of the experiences that we have had, which have dented our, our very own image. So you then hover um, in the darkness. If you've ever sailed in the sea, or even just the lake, at some point you can't see any land at all, and you don't know where you're headed, and you wonder whether you will ever see uh, land at all. But the captain can, because they have a compass. But you, without a compass, then do not know where to go next. And that's the challenge I'm dealing with here, a crisis of identity. That is where the African is. Um, and part of my interest in decolonization, the therefore, is to try and help the African to get the compass right, his own compass or her own compass or their own compass, so that they know where to head. Um, as a teacher, I'm aware 
that you don't give an illustration using a controversial topic, but allow me to, to do this in this one limited sense. Let's talk about, say, homosexuality, which is one area I've studied also. If you look at an African before a colonialism, there are civilizations among Africans that actually permitted homosexuality and practiced it. The white man comes and tells to register it as such. Um, the same white man undergoes transformation in his home and he comes back and tells you that now um, we have global human rights. We need to allow gays and lesbians. And now you tell him, this is an African. I don't know whether you guys can see the confusion I'm talking about through that example. And the confusion arises because of lack of con uh, order. Um, you know, and, and th that's the thing I'm trying to say, that we need to get order, we need to get a compass. And that is really why I'm keen on having some sense of direction. Um, customary laws versus Western laws. I, I thought I addressed the issue. My position is not for one or the other, um, but for a system of cross-pollination. Um, once you have your identity and you know where you're going, you can even take a lift. You see, if I'm on the highway, Nakuru Nairobi Highway, and I'm going to Nairobi, I can actually hike a lift from someone who is, living, who is from uh, Kisumu going to Nairobi, and they can take me somewhere on the road, isn't it? Uh, maybe you can take me 10 kilometers ahead, I'll walk, get a um, Mkokoteni or uh, Punda, or then. but I'm, I know where I'm going. That, that's what I'm saying. That once we have our customary law and we know what it is and what it is lacking and what, it could, what could add value to it, then we can know where to go. My problem is where we are at crossroads, have no idea where to go. So we go north 10 kilometers, realize we are going to the wrong direction, we come back. 20 kilometers south, we find someone is taking us northeast, we, you know, eventually we are lost. So we're just going around in circles and our energies are dissipated for no good at all. And, 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 and that is the complaint I have. Um, I think that comment also goes with the other one that we have over romanticized African culture. Um, I hope you got me correctly. What I was saying, and allow me to emphasize this for the last time today, um, is that the African has interacted with other civilizations. I gave, in, I gave illustrations of the Portuguese and the Christianity and the British and their Christianity and Western ways of life. I gave illustrations of the Arabs and their Islam nowadays the Hindu, and even more increasingly the Arabs and the Eastern civilizations or Asian civilizations. Um, I have no particular problem with any of those civilizations. In fact, I'm among the few decolon decolonization enthusiasts who have no problem with the other civilizations. Um, I just insist that the African must know themselves first and then engage with the new civilizations. Um, build up. There are things we didn't have. Build up on that. There are things we had but could benefit from more insights. I'm okay with that. Let's learn. Let's keep learning. There are gadgets like these gadgets we're using today uh, that are making Africans meet to discuss, in fact, um, a more important concept to them, which is decolonization. That is good. You know, take on as much as you can from the others, but you must know what you are first. You must know where you are going and then bring on board uh, things and tools and methods uh, that can help you to go there. I, I think that's really the point I'm making. I haven't said African culture is the only one, or we should go to the round heart without windows, or to 1600. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. Um, let's be open to ideas, uh, but let us not enter the market are not inferior in that marketplace. And we shouldn't allow any other civilization uh, to take us over and to dominate us for no good reason. Um, we must also have an input in that market of civilizations.
That's what I mean. Um, but as we do that, I have just been keen to emphasize that we must be aware that that must be a voluntary act. Um, that we must search our minds, um, search our souls in this marketplace and ask ourselves, what is that value? Is it building me? Is it destroying me? Does it destroy what I have? Does it make it better? But then, is that value part of the slavery era? Is that value part of the colonial epoch? Is that value also a continuation of neocolonialism or globalization? Um, once you're aware of that, then you should be fine. Um, you should be fine um, experimenting with new ideas while knowing what the fundamentals are for you. Okay, um, and that way then I have no problem at all, Africans moving forward with global ideas, um, global experiences, and we must do much more of that. The problem must be that in this marketplace, we have tended to imbibe ideas. In fact, rarely is just getting from one source, and as we get from that one source, we don't know what ours is, and eventually we are doomed. I keep asking my friends to tell me what African food they have eaten this week. I hope we are aware that corn or maize is brought, is imported here. I hope you are aware that wheat is imported here. I hope you are aware that rice is imported here. And I hope you are aware that everything you probably have eaten this week was not your food. Um, and that takes me to the other question that was asked. What indicators do I want? Those are some of the indicators. Did you also hunt and gather this week? Who amongst us uh, was able to gather and hunt this week? Hunted, hunted a rat, hunted a rabbit, and took that as part of the menu. By the way, allow me to also tell you that the meat you eat, the kind of animal variety you have in terms of zebu, all these animals are foreign. In fact, there's no longer um, any more local animals in the market. Um, I talked to you about Australia, uh, where I was surprised that uh, um, this tree that you call Mutimbao in Kiswahili um, does exceptionally well there. And it doesn't drain water there. It's a fantastic tree in Australia. Looks beautiful, taller, more built. And apparently it came from there. It was brought by the colonists here, you know. Um, do you even uh, know that most of the trees you have planted since you were born are all foreign, or the one you're probably sheltering under is actually an imported tree? Um, when we start having some African trees, local trees, indigenous trees growing all over the place, then I will start telling you that now um, indicators are doing well in our favor. Um, I just published a book um, on um, decolonizing state religion politics in Africa. I studied Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, for example. And what I found, for example, was that in all the schools in these three countries, they only teach Christian religious education and Islam in some parts. Kenya adds Hindu uh, religious education in very few schools. None of the three countries teaches traditional African religion. Okay, so if you're looking for indicators, the day you add traditional African religion in that curriculum, I will be happier. Is it to say that we do not have traditional African religion? Or that it cannot stand as a subject of its own? And so it was taught as part of CRE. I don't know, for those who are my age, uh, we were taught some parts of, BT, of uh, J J John S. BT, if you remember. Uh, his book, uh, uh, African Religion. Uh, they took some parts from that and taught us as part of CRE that Africans talked about ancestors, the living dead. Do you remember that kind of thing? Um, that was all gotten from BT and somebody just picked parts that they liked that could tally with Christianity or were not too offensive as African religion. But yes, African religion is a whole body that can make a subject. Why don't we teach it? in our schools. So the day that is also a major part of the curriculum, I will say we are doing well. 
Um, Mideva, Viva, Viva, I think congratulations. I'm happy that you are decolonizing the UK. Thank you. Uh, keep, keep the struggle and the fire burning. Uh, but you also mentioned authors. Um, it is possible that you can do an entire dissertation and not cite a single African scholar. And some of us are in this movement that believes that we must decolonize the footnotes and the bibliographies. They must have Africans there. And more importantly, decolonize the frameworks themselves, the conceptual frameworks, the theoretical frameworks. Have African theories um, to define your work. When I see more of that, I, that's an indicator. And I can go on and on forever. Um, just a warning about authorship. You, it's possible to even have uh, Wafla Waswa. That, that, that's an African who you are citing as an author. But the Wafla Waswa could actually be colonized himself or herself. And so whatever they are saying is a regurgitation of um, the ideas of Western scholars. Um, um, in Strathmore, I served as editor-in-chief of uh, the University Press, and some of the books that came there by Africans were relying on Western scholars. And the ideas were purely Western, even though the title author was just an African. I don't call that an African author. Uh, maybe that also answers Songoya and Mideva. Um, that is not an African scholar. Um, it's a colonized scholar propagating Western ideas. Um, so we must be very careful about that. Uh, just uh, to finish on something someone mentioned, literacy versus illiteracy, what is that? I sometimes I'm very confused about that. Um, one of the best, actually don't watch movies or any, but uh, sometimes I, I watch some documentaries. Um, I, I can't even follow a long story. But one of the one I've watched severally and I'm able to follow is that man, uh, it's called what? The Gods Must Be Crazy on uh, these televisions of ours or internet nowadays. But I've watched it probably 20, 30 times. And there is this Bushman that can find his way in the bush and has a lot of civilization there. He knows the medicines, he knows where the animals are, the dangerous ones and the ones that are not dangerous. And he's quite uh, okay in the bush, knowing where the waters are, how to deal with the monkeys and to identify this and that and that. Then there come white men in that bush with a, uh, you know, a plane who do not seem to be quite um, at home in that environment. Who is literate here and who is illiterate? Okay. But when the Bushman goes to the white court, uh, white man courts, he doesn't understand the language, what they're saying, and he's actually charged and convicted for not understanding uh, what was happening. Um, who is literate there and who is illiterate? When our children in these so called elite schools cannot walk to school, but must be driven, is that literacy? Cannot clean their own classes, but workers must do it. Is that literacy? But most important, cannot milk a cow. Um, okay? Cannot slaughter a chicken and get the bile out of it and get the imondo and, uh, and, and deal with it appropriately. Is that literacy? So I don't know what you call literacy, but for me, literacy might then require a more broad understanding that takes care of also our own unique experiences. Um, do you know the normal hubs that an African could use in a certain instance? Um, if you don't know, then you've been deschooled, okay? If you can't take care of sheep, take them to the river and back, or cows. I don't think you are schooled. I don't think you are literate. So the education requires to be all round in a sense, and, and that's why I'm insisting that I've not said African values only, no. And I've also not said Western values only, but I've said cr cross-cultural exchange that must go to the root of all these things that affect us on a daily basis. Let me just go through my notes here to see whether I've left any points, then I can conclude. Yeah, 
Um, I suspect that I've really gone through the points that were addressed, um, and I'm happy that we've had this conversation. Um, I'm happy that has been this vibrant in terms of quality, and this is what our university is. Someone is in university and is not doing this kind of thing, then they're actually illiterate because university is a place where ideas are exchanged. Allow me just to reiterate that I hope I have preached the message, uh, the gospel of uh, decolonization, and I hope that when I ask for an altar call, I don't know whether, whether this system allows us to do that, Luciana. Um, I hope I have some converts uh, because yeah. I have sown. Yeah? Uh, yeah? I was discussing with Ongoya, and I, I think, Luciana, you were there, yeah, about the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. And uh, this sower has this time gone to sow, and I'm hoping that the minds have received the message that I have preached um, and hopefully have a few converts. And as Melissa said, we start that kind of dialogue. It uh, doesn't have to be in a crowd. You don't have to be a good girl. Tiongo speaking to the whole world. Could just be a roommate, uh, your friend, uh, you know, your partner, um, you know, classmate. Uh, just mention that we had this, um, that your fundamentals were questioned, um, that what you thought was civilization has been questioned and that there's a new way of looking at things. Um, if we reach there, to be honest, I'll be so happy. And that's really the intention of coming on board today. Thank you very much. I thought I was coming to share, but I've learned, in the, uh, I've learned more than I shared. And I'm quite excited that this is going on. God bless you all and see you next time. Thank you. Asante, Dr. Ambani. I believe I speak for everyone when I say this was a very illuminating session and we have taken on board the views around doing a part two and I've taken on board the suggestion to discuss uh, Oloka, Onyonga, Oloka Onyango's work. We have taken that on board. Um, on behalf of my colleagues, thank you so much for taking the time to take us through your thoughts around decolonization. And I'd like to hand over the session now to my senior, Mr. Ongoya, to make his closing remarks and end the session for us. Thank you, everybody, for your patience as well. I really appreciate it. Asante Nisana. Mr. Ongoya, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luciana. As usual, your program directorship has uh, met your standard, which I never know at all. Sometimes I wonder whether it's worth it, me taking over from there. But having said that, uh, Mr. Dr. Bani, well, we, to have time, would have commented on Bogasu's uh, request about whether use of sharing in courts is part of the decolonization, but I uh, think it's special oh, time beyond the limits. Ongoya, Ongoya, can I just, Ongoya, if you allow, if we just allow Melissa one minute, she's done a lot of work on that. She can actually answer to it before we finish. Melissa, are you there? Melissa, yeah. Melissa? Yeah, I put a book in the chat by Shege Gibiora, um, just to show like the history and the linguistic studies around Sheng and how it is, even the statistics on the popularity of its usage, not only among the youth, but even in the title of the book, it, it speaks to a vernacular or a dialect. So how Prof was <laughs> making fun of some of our Kiswahili during the heart discussion. Um, yeah, it has a lot to do with dialects. It has a lot to do with intonation. It has a lot to do with um, some certain cultures like Matatu culture, you have a different type of Sheng is there, or when you mix it with the other ethnic, ethnic languages we have in our Kenyan societies. So in a way it, it, it fits uh, being used in the courts as a matter of dialect, as a matter of, of, of common usage. And I think it's about time that the court starts using the language that a particular party is used to. So yes, there is a growing um, popularity in the use of Sheng and Sheng as a diverse and what do you call it? Fluid um, language that is a carrier of culture. So I read the book, I put it somewhere in the, in the chat, the full title. Thank you. Um, having said that, I think uh, those of us who are decolonization advocates have two tasks in my humble view ahead of us. We have a task of coming out clearer on the question, why are we decolonizing? 
what, what are the aims, what are the ends we seek to achieve? And more critically for some of your critics would be, how will you measure those things? Uh, Dr. Mani, I trust you will agree with me that uh, your grandmother in the village regards Sheng as Lugaya Wakora. And therefore, if decolonization is mainstreaming Sheng, you must uh, also tell your critics how you will bring on board your grandmother who believes Sheng in Lugaya Wakora. But having said that, I'm very, very happy that we took part in this avid readers conversation. I am very happy that you showed up as you have done. We look forward to hosting you again as Kabarak University Law School in our forthcoming editions of the Avid Readers Forum. For us, our business is to generate and disseminate knowledge. Thank you so, so much, and you may discuss at your own pleasure. Luciana, you can close the session now as the host. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Uh, we will have the clip available also for anyone who would like to share it. We'll send you the link. Um, but for everyone, thanks for your patience. Thank you for your participation. Good evening and weekend. Asanteni. Thank <laughs> you.